In this class, we start to look at the definition of Six Sigma and what a Six Sigma process is. To start off with though, we need to understand the process capability ratio, PCR. And the process capability ratio can be calculated for any final quality attribute of your product. It can and should be used also for intermediate products, products that go from one stage to another stage within your process. Capability ratios do not have to be calculated only on those products that end up leaving your facility and go to your customers. So to define the capability ratio, we have to know the upper specification and the lower specification limits for that attribute. Let's say you're measuring the viscosity of the liquid. There's typically an upper and a lower specification limit that you've reported to your customer. Or if we are looking at some step in the middle of your flow sheet, these would be specification limits that you have set internally. Specification limits, remember from the earlier class, will typically be outside the upper and lower control limits. So the upper and the lower specification limits should not be confused with those. The simple definition for process capability is to take the upper specification limit minus the lower specification limit and divide by six sigma. Let's also be specific about how sigma is estimated. Sigma is estimated by taking data from your process when you know that it is stable. You can prove that by using a Schuart monitoring chart and only using data from in-control operation. In other words, there should be no special causes happening that you are aware of. To interpret the process capability ratio, we have to make the additional assumption that the process is exactly centered between the upper and lower specification limit, and secondly, that the attribute you're measuring has a normal distribution. That's easy to check. We've used the QQ plot for that in the past. So that's all there is to it. You sub in the upper and lower specification limits and divide by six times the estimated standard deviation. And you get a single process capability ratio number for that attribute. Let's try this out. Assume the mean of our process is 80, the lower specification limit is 65, the upper specification limit is 95, and our estimate of sigma is 10. Calculate the process capability ratio for that system. You should have got a value of 0.5. So let's interpret that, and it is very helpful to draw a diagram to illustrate the system. A system where the mean is 80 and has standard deviation of 10 units, assuming it's normally distributed, would have this shape. Let's now superimpose those lower and upper specification limits on there. And I've emphasized the region below the lower spec limit and the region above the upper spec limit. That's a lot of area that's shaded, indicating a lot of the product we're producing on our process is outside specification. This is actually a really bad process. A PCR of 0.5 is very undesirable. In fact, under the assumption of normal distributions, we can calculate the Z value for the lower spec limit and the upper spec limit. Can you do that before I show you the answer? You should have found values of plus and minus 1.5. And using the p-norm function, or looking this up on tables, we will find that 13.4% of our process production is outside the limits. That's 13.4% of our product that we are not able to pass on to our customers because they don't meet specification. Let's try it with a different system. This time the mean is still 80, the lower spec limit is still 65, and the upper spec limit is 95, but let's see what happens if we're able to reduce the variability in our process four times. That's a sigma this time of two and a half. So go ahead and calculate the PCR for that case. You should have got a value of two, and let's illustrate that again. This time notice how narrow that distribution is and how well it lies within the specification limits. The Z value for the lower and the upper spec limits are plus and minus six units, and so the shaded area is almost unobservable. So what we've learned from these two case studies is that a higher process capability ratio is more desirable. Perhaps you can now even see why it is called the process capability ratio. It is a measure of how capable our process is, how capable we are of staying within those limits. Remember, the process has a mean of 80, but it's never constant. That 80 will drift to the left and to the right. And sigma occasionally will get a little bit wider and sometimes narrower. No process is ever stable where those numbers stay exactly the same. So a high process capability ratio means that we've got the room to move within our lower and upper specification limits and still not produce bad product. 
I would like you to also notice one other feature about the process capability ratio. In this case, our standard deviation is 2.5. The distance from the upper spec limit to the lower spec limit is 30 units. This implies that the width of our specification is 12 standard deviations. We can fit 12 standard deviations side by side from the lower specification limit up to the upper specification limit. So a process capability ratio has two times six sigma, in other words, 12 sigma widths. A process capability of one implies that the width of the process is six sigma, three standard deviations from the mean to the lower specification limit, and three standard deviations from the mean to the upper specification limit, giving you a total width of six sigma. Let's illustrate that. Here I've drawn a process which has PCR equal to one. The lower and the upper specification limits are the same as in the prior example, but this time sigma is equal to five standard deviations. So the width of the process is six sigma. What is the area of probability under that distribution that lies outside the specification limits? You should have found the z values for the lower and upper specification limits to be plus and minus three. And then using the p-norm function in R, or from tables, you should have found that 99.73% of regular operation lies within the limits, and 0.27% of your operation lies outside the limits. That means if you've produced a thousand products on your process, only three of those thousand products lie outside the limits. That's still a high number. PCR equal to one unit isn't a desirable process, even though it sounds quite high that six standard deviations fit in the gap from the lower spec limit to the upper spec limit. Actually, what we term a six sigma process is a process where there are 12 standard deviations, six sigmas to the left and six sigmas to the right, giving a total of 12. So you can see then that a six sigma process is one where the capability ratio is 2.0 and such a process produces almost no off-specification product. In fact, a minimum requirement on a process is where the capability ratio is 1.3. Processes where the attribute being measured has a critical application or is there for safety purposes, we typically look for values of 1.7. And a capability of two units is the standard that we aim for as far as we possibly can within reasonable costs. Now there is one shortcoming of the definition that we've looked at, and that is of course the assumption that we're operating right in the middle of the lower and upper specification limit. Almost no processes have this exact midpoint. Mostly we are operating closer to one of the specification limits. And so we redefine the process capability ratio and we call it CPK as follows. We choose the worst option. Are we closer to the upper specification limit? Then we use this first equation. If we're closer to the lower specification limit, we use the second equation. Or we can combine it together in one equation and use the minimum function. In other words, we choose to report the capability that is the lowest. Let's emphasize once more two of the important assumptions in the CPK value. The attribute being measured has to be assumed normally distributed in order to interpret CPK in the way shown so far. And secondly, the assumption is that the process is stable, that no special causes are operating on the process. If there are special causes, we need to wait till the process is stable, then collect the data and calculate sigma from those data. Sigma calculated when the process is not stable is likely to be a much higher value, so you don't want to be using that sort of data anyway to calculate your capability. Now, I don't want you to go away and think that CPK is a fairly artificial number. This number is widely requested by customers. A customer wanting to purchase a significant quantity of product produced on your process will often come in before they sign the contract and inspect your process. And they will want you to prove that you have the capability of running your process in a reliable way that produces quality products within the specification limits. This is a number you're going to see regularly in your career. And even in cases where you are not requested to provide this number, it is worth calculating it anyway. It's very quick, it's easy, and it's a great way to show your boss that you've made a significant improvement in your process. You just need to show that you've gone from a baseline to a higher value, and that that higher value has improved the quality and stability of your process. If you can get to a CPK of 2.0, you've done a great job of improving the stability and the quality produced on that process. 
I've even seen cases in companies where bonuses and rewards are given to employees who can achieve CPK targets for the processes that they are responsible for. And that's the key that you need to understand about Six Sigma, is that single definition, the CPK number. Six Sigma is more than just that number, CPK. It also encapsulates the philosophy of producing good quality product on your process. How do we measure that quality? What is the error in our measurements? How reproducible are these measurements? Can we use linear prediction models to troubleshoot and find problems in our process? Can we use design of experiments to identify bottlenecks and problems in our systems and move our systems to find a better operating point? If you ever go into the area of study of Six Sigma, you will see all the tools that we've learned in this course used in that Six Sigma course. They're often wrapped up under the global umbrella of Six Sigma. But what Six Sigma does effectively is bring these tools together and make them operate coherently to achieve high quality production on your process.